if you want to talk, you'll have to take yourself off mute. There we go. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. So nice to see all of your faces. Um, I am going to just quickly introduce David. We're so excited to have King David here talking to us about his work and directly from his gallery space where he has a show this month. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly introduce David and then turn the floor over to him and then we'll be able to take questions at the end of his talk. Um, so we'll go from there. Um, so we are thrilled to put a spotlight on King David as our featured artist for September, 2023. David is an artist based in Brooklyn, New York, where he is now, um, who studied with Alan, John and the Leo Marshute School in 2015. His first solo exhibition is right now in Chelsea in New York and it's titled Jamaica. And it runs from September to October of this year at Sean Scully's studio turned gallery 447 space. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to David. Hello, you guys. Thank you all for joining us. It's nice to see all your lovely faces today. Um, as Rose just mentioned, I'm sitting here in this gallery. I was actually just telling her the story about how this how this kind of happened. And I think that's the perfect way to sort of intro you guys into the journey that led me um, to displaying this work in this space. Um, I could start way back in college. Um, my sophomore year in college, the year before I would have studied at Marshoots, um, my, I said to my professor at school at, who was Amir Kobashile, he's a, a really amazing figurative painter, um, landscapes, uh, Bosnian refugee from the war. So he has a, a wealth of intense material to pull from. I remember saying to him at that point that I was really intent on painting abstractly and on focusing on abstraction and figuring out something within that realm or within that sort of self-imposed limitation as he would call it. And Sean Scully was one of the first artists that he showed me. Um, and he, he, he first, I remember he Googled abstract art just to bring up like a whole bunch of like colorful, like nonsense, like decorative stuff. And then he goes, he says to me, 99% of abstract art you're gonna see is really bad. <laughs> but but I can show you a good one right now. And then he pulls up Sean Scully's name and then he goes, this is real abstract painting, focused, um, deliberate, and at the same time free and, uh, and, and, and expressive. And I remember that so vividly uh, just because it was the first time I was being introduced to abstract painting in the context of fine art in, and, and within the context of my own academic growth in, in the arts. So cut to, um, Marshoots a year later, and the, and I, I think this is important to bring up because so much of what we focus on in Marshoots and so much of what we, uh, what what our philosophy is based around it has so much has to do with light and light is it really is everything as it pertains to painting but also as it pertains to sculpture, drawing, uh, watercolor. These are the, some of the other mediums that actually flesh out the rest of this body of work that aren't part of this particular display. Um, that conversation helped me understand abstract painting and on a whole nother level because it led me to understand that the the light in this in this kind of painting doesn't always speak through the sort of illusion of painting as it pertains to the way that color is laid in in opposition to shadow and light and val or and value and saturation but the the illusion of painting as it pertains to material and as it pertains to the process and the way that the process relates to the conceptual realm from which all of this stuff is pulled. So honing in on that understanding of light was something that I had that I that I could only grasp through the Marshutsian, you know, focus on impressionism and on and on the mark the mark as in its relation to the other mark in the space. Because this is as important if you are observing real space as it is if you are creating uh, an imagined space that people that you expect people to step into and accept and believe. And, and and then, you know, question, ponder further. So, you know, cut again, years later to, this must've been 20, I think 2018, Sean had a gallery exhibition at Lison Gallery, which is a couple blocks up from where I am right now. And um, some really, you know, large scale abstract paintings in his, in his um, classic style that he's become known for. And me and a friend of mine uh, went to the artist talk for that show. And we stayed until the very end, until after he was done talking to everyone else in the room. And when I walked up to shake his hand, he 
he he like had his he like had his arms open and just hugged me and my friend like this and was just like it's so great to see you guys and that was my first time meeting him so i was immediately like okay now i can understand that um painters you know we have a different kind of a language and we can tell when we're in the presence of one another and when we're having different a different level of conversation so he you know we kind of like hit it off from there um he invited me to this to this space that at the time that he was using as his studio and at the time he actually had a lot of his own paintings in here that really like are you know even bigger scale than mine not to not to make myself seem small because this is the biggest thing I've ever done but it was an inspiration to really to meet him in that way and for him to embrace me he ended up um actually buying a painting of mine the year after that and that was really the big step towards I think him accepting that I was an artist that could make a body of work that could justify being in this space. Um, and over, over these past couple of years, he's actually started to paint here less. So because he's here less, the space has become one that he is more comfortable showcasing certain artists in. Um, so that's kind of the, the, sh the shortened version of a long story of how this, how this process started. And then the, the, the story of that as it relates to the actual painting, um, I'll tell you now, comes directly out of my last body of work with, that I displayed in the summer of 2021, which was called American Monarchy. Um, that body of work was all about uh, the American context, the, you know, the, the, the sort of political social upheaval that we were experiencing in that time that we've sort of consistently experienced throughout American history. And it's, you know, in that way, as what I realized coming out of that body of work was that I was remarking on a lot of stuff that people have remarked on that people will continue to remark on that that may that I may or may not really have any influence over. And in that, and so I was kind of disillusioned. Not that I'm not not to say that I'm not really proud of that work because I think that it's strong and I think that it speaks to the time that it was made um, in a very uh, in in a true way. But what what I the question that I found myself asking was do I want to continue working on stuff that's based in that subject matter? And, and if not, what is going to motivate me to, to, you know, make another body of work that I'm going to spend a, a serious amount of time on and, and, um, and really challenge people with. And that was where the, it's, it's really an answer that I know inherently. It was just a matter of asking the right question, so to speak. But um, it's, it's, it's my own culture. It's, you know, the, the, the countries of my mother and father's birth, my father was born in Trinidad and Tobago. My mother was born in Jamaica and they both immigrated and met here. And that was pretty much how our, the, 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 the story of my family uh, meeting in Brooklyn in this in Flatbush, the area that I still live in now that is a that is a hugely Caribbean area for the past 50, 60, 70 years. Um, so being that I, I wanted to build up, build out these cultural conversations that I know I could speak to in a much more honest way than really anyone else, if you ask me, um, I, I decided to set out like a five-year plan. So the idea is to do this body of work, which took me basically two and a half years to bring forth and spend the next half of the five years making the Trinidad and Tobago body of work, and then continuing to build out those conversations throughout the course of my artistic career for as long as I'm able to do it. Because I think that those are the places that I can offer the most unique voice that can at the same time um, affect people in whatever way it affects them. You know, that's something that I have to accept. I don't have too much control over, but what I can do is bring the culture into this conversation of fine art in this world where it has necessarily um, been spoken of from a, from a first person perspective, from the, from an inside towards the outside, as opposed to it being looked at from the outside uh, within. Um, so basically I was, I was my show that was open in, uh, July and August of 2021, the American Monarchy uh, exhibition. At, at that time that that show was up, I was already working on the first piece in this body of work, which is um, called Tacky's War, which I'll show you guys a little bit later. Uh, at that time, I was working on that piece, not really knowing that it was going to come up in here. And then serendipitously, um, Sean ended up sending me an email after I had I had initially asked him to do that that show in 2021 in the space, and he had so, he told me no, because he was like the space is really reserved for older folks, for people who uh, could use the opportunity at the latter parts of their careers, and 
then I did that show in 2021. And for whatever reason, he ended up changing his mind and he, he ended up giving me this spot for September, 2023. Right. So I pretty much said to that email, don't say anything more. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you in like two years because I was like, all right, now I can spend this time and work and understand that not only is this painting going to go in here, but I can plot out how to build up a conversation that is again, at the scale necessary to, to justify being in the space. So the first phase of the body of work, and actually let me, let me flip around so you guys can see the paintings that I call the first phase paintings, which are behind me over here. These were the three paintings that I did um, in the, basically the first year of the series, first year, year and a half, so to speak. Um, so this one was the first one over here. The one in the corner there was the second one. And the one right behind me was the one that I did towards the end of last year into this year. So that piece behind me is on a uh, wood uh, MDF board, which is a multi-density fiber board, like pressed wood pulp. That piece is on plexiglass, two sheets of plexiglass. And that piece is on a copper sheet that's mounted onto wood. And the thing that links those pieces um, outside of their, or so or I should say within their material uh, differentialities is the research from that phase of the, of, of, of my, uh, of delving into this series, the research that produced that painting first, that then bled into producing that painting, that then also informed this painting, but also uh, a sort of a, I call it almost like a, like a, it's, you know, when you, uh, you know, when you have those, like uh, those finger traps, the Chinese finger traps, and like, you have to like, you have to, it's a paradox. You have to like go in to let it, to make it loosen up. That's kind of what happened as I got, as the research got uh, more intense, my, uh, my specificity as it pertained to the subject matter started to expand outwards from the research into my own personal relationship with the subject matter. And this is, this is like a tough thing because um, fine art can, can tend to be so personal to the maker, but then you have to accept from, from a, from a, in, in my opinion, a very Zen point of view that you let it go, right? You, you have to, you have to let it be personal, but then also, let it be whatever it's going to be for other people free from those shackles. And that was what a lot of what I contended, contended through these first three paintings that are very textured, very dense, very um, uh, materially intense. Uh, these are the thickest paintings in the series as it relative to the other ones. And these were the ones that took the longest to dry, even though they're technically the smallest compared to say a piece like this one over here, which is across four panels. Uh, that's like 16 feet wide. And, but that piece is much, much looser and much uh, thinner in paint because what I wanted to do was move out of this section when I, from this first year of work that was really thick and really viscous and gooey and, um, and chemically involved and then step back into a realm where I was not only having more fun with the, with the, with the process, but relating to it in the parts of the culture that were not as gravitationally bound. Uh, the, I can I can tell you very quickly before we get into the the next section of my talk where I'm going to open it up to hearing from you guys and um, answering any questions and also walking around to show you some of these pieces in closer detail. Um, that this piece in the corner, the research behind that piece has to do with one of the one of the slave rebellions in Jamaica that took place in the 1750s, I believe, or 60s. Uh, that the title of the piece is called "Is Tacky's War." It's a reference to that. And actually, like what I'm going to do real quick is drop in the chat a link to a um, folder that I just opened up for you guys to look at some materials from the show. So you guys can look at the stuff while I'm talking. One sec. Let me find it. There we go. This is just a folder with some of the uh, videos from our install of the show and also the images of each piece that are in the checklist, just so you can look at those, even if they're, they're not immediately behind me. Um, so where was I? Yeah, these things were, <laughs> they're really thick and they took really long. And and that's, I was kind of, um, the, 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 the question I was facing at that point was, do I wanna make the whole rest of the body of work like that? Or do I wanna step back from pieces that are so in, so intensely material and relay that in a different way. And that was where I got to pieces like this one on the, over here, which was 
the first piece that I did after that, this one was the first piece that I did after that, that, that phase of fainting that the, the first phase that I consider it. And this piece is only three layers thick. And yet it still con conveys a really intense material conversation because of the colors that were chosen. So in essence, what really happened is I, I, I sifted through my own personal style in the research of those paintings. And then when I got back to the, my personal relationship with the subject matter, I, I had to depersonalize the painting by relying again on those same uh, rules that we touched on so way back in our shoots and, uh, and, and, and you know, in our academic time that create the illusion of painting, which has to do with the color choices and the way that we inlay them and the relationships between them, what's sitting on top of what, what's behind what, what shines through what, what is obscuring what, all of those, all of these kinds of questions and answers that you can search through the piece and, and, and engage with. And that's, and that's a lot of what that piece is about from the painterly perspective with, and then on top of that, it's, it has everything to do with my, my relationship with my family's um, historical like relationship with Rastafari and Rastafarianism being a huge uh, spiritual movement in Jamaica that has a lot to do with the black people in Jamaica who had a lot of their identity stripped from them, reclaiming a sense of that and finding it anew in the, in the Caribbean context and in the context of a, of a, uh, of a colony of the, the the United Kingdom and the Americas and a place that's still sort of subject to those whims. Um, so it's it's a painting about in, in, in essence control or lack thereof and where that's found and where that's disregarded. Um, that piece opened me up to moving into this one, which is flip again. And again, if you open up that folder, you can see some image, images of each of these individually. Um, oh. This piece, <laughs> thank you. This one is this one is uh, another four panel. Um, the one that I just showed you was on uh, four panels of plywood. This one is on four panels of plexiglass. So again, the 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 the, the, diff, the conversation of the different uh, physical characteristics of paint in different physical contexts is still there. But what I'm but I'm investigating that with less layers that have more way more to do with the choices of the colors that I pick, and a little bit less to do with um, a conversation of addition and removal. Now again, that's still there too. But th that's the kind of stuff that I wish you guys could all be here so you, so we could get up close and see because that's when you can really get into um what is shrouded and what is revealed, and I, and that's a huge part of this conversation too because the the search for a, a new a new identity. This is something I referenced in the press release of the show too, which you can also access in that folder. Um, the search for a new sense of self out of, out of uh, things like uh, colonialism and slavery and the transatlantic journey and all of its violence, but also um, the, it's, it's violent, but it's also something that gives people an opportunity to find something new. And that is, that is a necessary way to look at it not not because it's uh it's 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 a uh, optimistic but because it's realistic because if you don't look at it like that then you only you only end up seeing it for all of the bad and that was a lot of what these dense heavy paintings that i was talking about from the first phase um i realized that if i did a whole room of that that it would have just relayed that and then you would have walked in and felt really heavy it, it would have felt super heavy-handed and then you would have walked out and been like God damn, like, I don't know, I don't even know if I want to go look at those again. And one of the things that I think great abstract painting has to have is, and is a, a characteristic that creates a desire within a viewer to want to keep looking at it for extended periods of time. The same thing that we speak about the great, the great impressionist works doing, especially when we talk about like late Cezanne, right, where his eyesight starts to become very, very, uh, very difficult and the paintings start to become blurrier and more abstract and more about, again, the impressions of a space as opposed to a, uh, a, um, a, a, represent, a scientific recreation of a space. Uh, I consider myself in the line of these artists because of the way that we learned to consider how they thought about what they did in the South of France, right? So now when I think about um, establishing a space that I want, that I want someone to step into, of course, it's inspired by real spaces because everything that we see influences everything that we might do on an artistic plane. 
this piece is called Blue Mountain Bingy. So it's in in the first place, it's referencing the Blue Mountains of Jamaica, which is a place that is ostensibly really beautiful, you know, captures the light in a way that when I when I when I was in when I was at Marshoots, I always was reminded of the of the Caribbean because the, the, the light is so unique in those two places. And it has this it has it has a way that it spreads warmth across the whole sky, but in different tones. And that's it's it's kind of confounding, but it's you know as as scientific as it is spiritual. Um, the blue mountains in Jamaica catch the light in that same kind of way. They they call them blue because they those hues of green can travel into the blues and into the purples when they start to catch the reds from the sky and the oranges and all that kind of stuff. And the the tone of this painting is me thinking about again the beauty of that to live to to as as they as Bob Marley would say, lively up myself, right? Because not not everything has to be heavy handed and intense and brutal, but and at the same time, considering that part of the beauty of this place is the way that it sheltered, the way that it the way that it uh, under the cover of night, so to speak, figuratively sheltered the uh, the the people so that they could form something like Rastafarianism, and so that they could have what the other title the other side of the title of the piece. Uh, implies, which is Naya Bingi, which uh, Bingi in the title is a shortened version of Naya Bingi, which is the name for the Rastafari spiritual ceremony that um, my own granddad used to participate in when he was young in Jamaica back in the day. So this is something that like is very directly relevant to to me and to how I consider my own spiritual spiritual identity in the context of all of this history that I'm contending with. And also in the context of what I'm trying to give to people or what I what I think the work may give to people. I hesitate to say trying because all that I'm trying to do is create create things and the chips will fall where they may. But I understand that, um, especially by engaging the work with things like figurative, these, I mean, these big prints that are against the wall, I have to mention those as well. Uh, these are the kinds of things that are probably the most didactic things in the room at the same time, they're the most accessible. And so I, this is a big step for me to introduce this kind of work alongside um, the, the paintings, which are, to, which are at the same time as they're more obscure, they're also a, a much more familiar language for me. So what I'm doing with these prints is, and with the photo work that's in the show that, I, that I'll, again, I'll walk over and show you the small photos in a second when I start to move around. Um, is offering a little bit more to the to the to the puzzle, so that over the years, what I've what I've come to really understand is that um, as much as I can talk about this stuff, if there's not some sort of like resource for that person that wants to access those things, a lot of the work can stay can stay clouded. And there's something beautiful about that. I I, I as an art as a person who enjoys art enjoys that a lot. I enjoy that a lot because. I don't necessarily think that everything has to be explained all the time. I think that there's beauty in like looking for the answers and finding the truth in in the context of how we how we perceive what we perceive. Not, not to say that there is that there is a, not a truth that the artist is trying to convey, but that's not always relevant to the beauty of the work itself. So in be, in becoming more okay with letting go of that, I be, I've become more okay with offering something like a photo print, right, which is so straightforward that it starts to, it almost makes me uncomfortable. But at the same time, it's the subject matter that I think justifies itself and justifies its presence alongside these paintings. When I'm looking at this wall, the huge, my huge consideration was balancing it out with the colors to make sure that this, that this intense darkness, which is not necessarily a, it's a, it, to me, it's a more, it's a very inviting darkness. It's not like it's darkness and it's, and it's pushing you away and it's scaring you. It's darkness that offers shelter. Is, is is balanced out by the greens and the reds and the light, the more obvious light that this that this piece offers. In the same way, if I go to this wall, the the oversaturation of this piece and the intensity of it, the brightness is balanced out by the general shadowy nature and the overall black and whiteness of this one that then comes back with a little bit of the, the muted hues in that stormy sky over Montego Bay that again, uh, sh these things should only expand and, and uh, as opposed to contract the conversation that the paintings offer. So after much consideration of the whole process, the, the, this second part of the process that involved not only these paintings, but looking through a lot of my, a lot of my prints after I went to Jamaica last year and took all of these photos, um, I realized that some of them were compelling enough images that they could hold 
hold their weight next to these things and and only offer more to the conversation. And then the final thing I'll show you guys before we open it up is obviously the piece that I was that I had initially behind me, which is uh uh across eight panels of uh, plexiglass. Um, that one was the final, the last thing that I did in the show. Um, uh, what can I say about it? It's 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 in a lot of ways, it's a culmination of this movement of painting of mine, so to speak. Um, it's also a, a big challenge for me, but also really exciting because this is a scale that I have wanted to work at for a long time, but you know, didn't always have the space to know that it was going to go up and look and look as nice as it needs to look in terms of um, the piece not feeling too big for the space because that can that can really kill things. Um, and I think that it's also a, a, a fairly lighter painting, again, in terms of the, the texture, in terms of the actual layers of physical paint on it. But because it's on plexiglass, it, it really lends itself to that illusion of levitating paint in front of you, which is to say the light is able to move through the plexi. It doesn't stop on the surface the way that it might on canvas or even wood. And in, to that effect, the piece is given its own sort of inherent luminosity because of the surface that it's on. And then I can accentuate that and play with that in terms of light and shadow based on my, my color choices, especially in the, in the, in the uh, context of this piece's subject matter, which is about one of my cousins actually who was killed in Jamaica last year. Um, so this is, it, it was huge for me because it was a big marriage of uh, the more academic, the research, the stuff that I like went to school and got good at, but not necessarily, but never really, un never really uh, enjoyed to be totally frank, um, unless it was specifically about like art or art history. Although now I understand why, I, why those skills are relevant. So it's, this piece represents a huge marriage of all of that with the stuff that I can't help but respond to that I think at, that I think anyone that has that artistic impetus to create can relate to that it's not a matter of uh, the thing that I always say whenever I speak to students is like the difference between artists and everyone else is that you can tell artists not to do it 10,000 times and they're still going to do it because there's something else driving that need to respond, that need to create, that need to make a, make a statement or remark or leave something behind that goes beyond logic and reason even. And for me, this, this piece is a huge gesture of, um, of remorse, but also respect. And um, in the end, glorification, I think to a degree that the person that this piece references may have never experienced in life. And also in, in reflection meant to um, bring that back up as it pertains to all of the subject matters of all of these pieces, because that's sort of the, that's the feeling that I want the whole show to leave with you. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the the story conceptually of how all this stuff happened and where it came from and you know how it ended up here. And uh, yeah, I think what I what I wanted to do now, um, and anyone who wants to ask questions, Rose will field you guys, um, and then I can uh, I can uh, uh, speak about whatever you want to bring up. Um, I you know we can do it totally the style that we're used to. In terms of marshoots, you know, you can ask like some crazy deep question and we, you know, we can go crazy about it. Um, I'm going to switch also to my phone in a sec so that I can walk around with that and show you guys some like close ups on another screen so that you can see like, um, you know, some some of the texture and some of the other stuff that's going on. But yeah, thanks for listening. And I hope that that illuminated things a bit more for you guys um, and helped you understand a bit of how this happened and, you know, what this what all this work is about. It's, you know, very dear subject matter to me, but it's the kind of stuff that I want to do my best to make accessible to everyone else. So in that, you know, in that spirit, you can open it up. And again, thanks for listening. Wow. Thank you, David. So beautiful. Um, if anybody has questions, I think we're a manageable enough group that you can just unmute yourself because you're all automatically muted. So just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, and if there's multiple people, I can help field or call on people or whatever, but um, feel free to just ask questions. Maybe I'll start, David. Um, I'm so interested in the large photo prints that you have 
alongside your paintings as well. And did you go and take those photos specifically for this body of work? Did you travel down to the Caribbean and do those um, with this show in mind or did you take them in the States or um, I'm interested in your process for those photos that are all blown up and Good. on the panels. Awesome question. I'll walk, if you guys look at the screen that I have it's connected to my phone, I'll take you guys over to the, the two rivers piece, which is the intro piece to the show. So this is kind of like the place where you see more of the photos fleshed out, what they are, um, kind of how they, this is meant to be like that sort of intimate introduction into this sort of grand, grander conversation that's happening with everything else. Um, so I can, I'll like, I'll like walk along this line and kind of answer that question, which is that the story behind this is, cause this was not something that I was planning on doing like when I was making the, the, the first couple paintings uh, two years ago, I should say. What happened was my, I took these pictures with a Holga camera, 35 millimeter mm -hmm. point and shoot, very, very simple camera. And it was, it was actually a gift from one of my good friends from high school. Uh, his name is Matt Barton. He's a, um, he's an advertising director actually, but he also got his master's from a SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. He is, photography is like really his, his main um, visual language, so to speak. That's like the thing that he made, did his like masters on and everything. So whenever he and I relate artistically, I'm mostly, most of the time talking about paintings and he's talking about photography. And so this was his, he got me the camera as a, uh, as a gift, like maybe two years ago for my birthday. And I didn't use it for like a whole year. And then when this trip came up, this, this leads into the story actually of this trip, which this picture perfectly speaks to. Um, my grandma, who is this person that's looking out at the, at like the view of our land from our front porch. So this house right here is our family's house in Jamaica. And she's sitting like right here at the bottom of the steps, looking outwards at the road that leads up to our house. Um, wow. The trip that we, that she and I took to Jamaica last year was significant because it was the first trip she was taking with her American passport. So she had just recently got natural, her naturalized citizenship like a couple months before that. And we had been talking for the whole year leading up to last summer, not this past summer, but the summer of last year about finally going back together. And, you know, she was excited about the fact that she would be able to spend time there indefinitely, finally, and not have to worry about coming back or, you know, and losing her status as a, to, to be, of being able to, um, to be in the country. So that it was significant for her for those reasons, also because I'm her first grandchild. So it's like going back with her first grandchild as an adult. The last time I was in Jamaica, I was eight years old. So it was it was also significant wow. for me because it was almost 20 years since I had been there. So I was like, I'm not going to definitely I'm not going to be able to like bring like paints and like sit down long enough to like make actual paintings while I'm there. So instead, I'll take this camera. I'll buy like I think I bought like eight rolls of film and, you know, this was my way of creatively responding to everything that I was being exposed to, um, recording it. And by the time, like I said, when I came back and was looking through all of these, I was like, okay, I have something here. These can be the perfect thing that like open up the show and lead you into everything else. Wow. So I hope that, hope that answers your question. Yeah, so great. And then how did you select which ones to um, to print really large alongside uh, yeah. the paintings? The big ones. So this was a, like a whole thing. Um, I did, a, I had a big photo print in my show two years ago. That was a conceptual piece that was a, uh, a an iPhone photo that my aunt had sent to me. And there was a whole story behind that. I'm not going to go into it too deeply right now, but that was the first time that it made sense to me to have a photo uh, in conversation with the paintings. And so that was like the first big step towards this sort of display where I think it's, it's, it's culminating in a super successful way. Um, I, I was, when I was initially thinking about which ones of these to print big, because I, after I looked through them all, I realized that I would want to print a couple of them big. I just didn't know how many I was, I had like made a separate folder of like the candidates of them that I was looking through. And then I went through to my uh, printer. His name is Steven. Actually, they're coming through here later today to do some filming and stuff. Um, oh, they run a print shop in Brooklyn called Brooklyn Editions. And they, I've used them for years to make all of my prints, prints that I might make for collectors, um, 
prints for posters, anything like they're, they're the best. So I, the, the cool thing about Steven is that his history is that he was a um, commercial photographer who ended up becoming disillusioned with the commercial industry because of its lack of, you know, creates creative uh, regard. So he's the kind of guy that because he likes this kind of stuff, he'll sit with me for like an hour, hour and a half and listen to me brainstorm and offer ideas and potential ways to display stuff outside of what I might even be thinking about. Mm -hmm. And so when I was looking through these pictures, I was like, uh, I would do, I, should I do like all horizontal? Should I do, I want to get some verticals in there. Maybe how do I do it? And he goes, maybe you can put them like together. Like, have you thought about that? And as soon as he said that, the like bingo light went off in my head because I realized that for the past two years, I had been doing these paintings mm. in, out of multiple panels and putting them together, mm. right? Like this, this is the, this is the, like the little line between these two panels. So I had already been planning to hang these paintings side by side with the, with their, um, with the middle parts flush against one another. And so I realized that in, to have the prints this way, side by side, press up light against each other, creating the illusion, like it's one piece, um, was materially continuous with everything else in the room. And so that pretty much was the was like the click that where I realized that all I got to do now is figure out which ones are the right ones to put in conversation with everything else that aren't too, you know, too pretty, too like tropical, like paradise kind of pictures that were still, that still kind of offered some, some, um, you know, some like some meat to grab onto. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also were the ones that, that helped the flow of the room. So like this one, this one does the thing where you can you move across this wall and then when you get here you'll you naturally move next move over to this and then that one does i think this in my opinion the same thing especially because of this black bar at the top that not only pushes you down but pushes you to but pushes you to the right so this is like a frame a frame of a painting where that like you know that black bar just offered something to me that was abstract enough and implied enough movement to keep the room going also this line in this one this, this uh, clothing line, this is the view, this is the view from my house's porch as well. But instead of the bottom of the stairs, this is from the top of the stairs, looking outwards towards the, at the hill, like from our house. So this line became a really strong element that helps you get, get from this painting over here and then from over here to over there. Beautiful transition. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Wow. Um, yeah, so those, that, that was some of the thinking behind the... Um, where am I here? Can I ask a question, oh. David? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Of course, I'm here. I would love because I on the the chat I brought up the portrait of your grandfather. Is that what the name of it is? It portrait oh. of grand. Portrait of my grandma. That's my. That's for my grandmother. I can. I'll walk up to that one if you want. But or or this David. Uh huh. That beautiful. That beautiful. Uh, it's incredible. Your that eight. I think it's eight paintings about your cousin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one back wow. here. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you, you know, how you brought that up. Did you bring them up all together? And also how how the subject matter, as you were working, was it the subject matter that was sort of inspiring you to put strokes where you put them. I mean, there's a beautiful transition I see through sort of the lighter side over to the darker side. I'd love for you to just talk about that. Sure. Um, in relation to the subject matter, how you, how the subject matter affected how you put paint on there. Of course, of course. So yeah. there's, yeah, I'll talk about it like this. Back. And this is, this is gonna be fun too, because it's gonna oh, get wow. dark, so just get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we're actually working on a documentary series about all this stuff. So um, everything that I'm saying today, I'm glad that we're recording it for you guys to be able to look back at. We're also going to have like videos where I'm going to be going through all of these stories in, you know, this yeah. kind of detail so people can access that later on. But since you asked, the, I, in my opinion, the right way to talk about this is to speak about how it came about from the, from the story and then how that led me into the process of the painting because the story informs why, how the painting came to be this way yeah so my cousin the painting is called kush in loving memory dusk, dawn to dusk mm -hmm. and kush kush was the nickname of one of my cousins in jamaica his name was his real name was sheldon so he i actually met him for the first time when i went back 
in the in the in, you know August of last year. He was somebody who my grandma would he he would always come around to the house and help my grandma out with all type of stuff. Um, Jamaica is very Jamaica is still very poor for most of the people who live there. A lot of people don't really know that because the the uh, the marketed you know the, the the image that they market is this tourist paradise. But when you live there, you're more than likely living under a third world circumstances. So this guy is you know my grandma is somebody who is a really huge figure in our in our in our um in the community that my family is from because she was not only did she have seven kids that she and my granddad were able to raise uh, and you know feed them all and clothe them all and, and make them all into people that have uh perp that have a purpose right and and um and and are doing well for themselves but the 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 blessings of that trickle down to all of the people that associate with my family so Kush was one of these people who wasn't as a, wasn't like a close relative of ours, but he would come over and do stuff around the house. He would help my grandma cook. My grandma has like a bad foot these days, so she can't really do a lot of the stuff that she used to be able to do. So a lot of people will come around and help her because they know that if I help grandma, I'm going to get a plate of food at the end of the day. Or if I help grandma, I'm going to get, you know, like um, if when my kid needs a shirt for school, she's going to make sure to send for a shirt or she's going to make sure to that, that I'll get some money to buy like church shoes or, um, you know, pencils for their school supplies or anything like she's just the kind of person that whenever people display that kind of need, she, she can't help but want to help them out. So that prefaces me meeting Kush, who is somebody that had a lot of that relation kind of relationship with my grandma for years before I ever met him. Um, he the night that I met him, he was in the back of our house roasting breadfruit, which is one of the things that we eat with like a lot of our food in Jamaica, it's this, this big green awesome fruit um, with like a starchy interior. And he was back there with his, I think the kid is like six, maybe would have been six at the time, his son named Jeremiah. Um, this, the kid has a, a childhood, like or like childhood diabetes. He, so like, you know, he's like a little cute little kid with like a, uh, with like his teeth are like, you know, when kids have diabetes, their teeth uh, grow in this like very particular way where they're stacked. And, um, mm -hmm. and they have a lot, oftentimes like a, like a, like a podge, like a podge belly, like a, like a round belly, even though he's like a skinny kid. So it's, it's obviously a third world situation that they're living in where he has childhood diabetes, but there, it's not like he can do a lot about it, but he does as much as he can. Um, I met him back there and we, we pretty much spent like an hour talking about over, over a joint, talking about like all the things about that, that he tries to do for his son and the way in which grandma helps him out and how he's, you know, he loves to come over and like cook bread food for grandma because he's like, I know we're going to, Jeremiah going to get some healthy food. And, you know, we, I'm not going to, uh, you know, at least we're good until tomorrow and da, 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 da. so me and him really just hit it off from there. He, he kind of came over every single day and was hanging out with me and doing stuff around the house and yada, yada, yada. So I'll cut, cut forward in time. Cause I'll, I'll spend forever talking about this. Trust me. Um, I left Jamaica at the end of August last year, uh, after being there from the, for the, for those four weeks that I was there and the last thing that he did for me was um, cut up some sugar cane for me to take back that I was planning on flying back with because you can't fly back with fruits whole or like vegetables, but you can fly back if you cut them up and like put them, you know, in a container. So he cut up the sugar cane for me and then my freaking suitcases were too heavy. So I wasn't able to fly back with it. And my grandma still has a sugar cane in our freezer in Jamaica waiting on me. Um, so I flew back and like maybe three, four months later, my grandma's calling me and she's like, yo, she had called me like the Friday and I didn't pick up because I was busy. And she had called me the Saturday and I didn't pick up because I was busy. And then I called her back the Monday and I was like, yeah, grandma, you was calling me. What's up? Just, you know, thinking she's going to be like, hey, you know, just I just maybe you could send me some money or something. She's like, you know what happened? I'm like, what happened? She goes, you know, they kill they kill our friend. I'm like, what are you talking about? She proceeds to tell me the story about how he and his um uh the the mother of jeremiah his son who they the two of them live to the three of them live together she has a history of unfortunately mental issues and you know like like schizophrenia that kind of stuff like um bipolar whatever you want to call it uh obviously this is again third world context so a lot of this stuff goes undiagnosed un, untreated unhandled unaddressed until it boils over into situations like this um so they got into a dispute uh, Kush tried to leave with Jeremiah so they're like going down the road and she's like she's like chasing them down the road she ends up stabbing him cutting out his heart killing him um, all this happening while the kid is watching so 
in one, you know, fatal stroke, Jeremiah loses both of his parents. And, you know, not only the one that like was looking out for him all the time, but the one who, you know, would have been the, the other one left is like, you know, she's gone too. They, 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 they found her and since locked her up. So this is the, this was like the conversation that she and I were having where I, as the, the way that painters tend to do, it's like, I don't really know how to make sense of this thing or even contend with it much more than I can in this realm, which is to say like, this is the, this is the response to it. This is, this is the, this is me trying to put it somewhere where I can put it somewhere, you know, where it's not just taking up space in my head and, and, and racking me or bothering me. And at the, and, and at the same time, um, trying to relay the best parts of what I was able to get from him while I was with him into something that I can then relate to the world where it's only those pieces of him that are left in the conversation because what I know his son is gonna remember of him because the kid was like attached at the, to, at the hip to, to his dad was the fact that for the first maybe six or seven years that he had his dad, that he was look, that he looked out for him every moment of his life. And that to me is something beautiful that uh, speaks to a legacy of fatherhood in our context that and in our cultural context that isn't often spoken to and when it is spoken about it's normally spoken about with with detriment and um with a lot of criticism lo and behold you can find people in the in you know the worst situations that are doing their best and that was what that was really what i took from him and what i what what to me was inspiring about him and what you know made it necessary for me to do all of this so I tell that whole story because the whole thing with the painting is this movement from one context to another, from light to dark, from from uh, brightness to shadow, but also not shadow it, that is uh, all, sh not shadow that is enveloping, but shadow that is that, that has layers to it. Shadow that speaks to the potentially the place that we go when we're not here, but also what we leave behind and the essences of all the marks that that not only we literally leave behind, but figuratively that influence people based on how we, you know, just the, the, the way that we exist as human beings. I think that I'm one of the people who believes that like, if you just display goodness, then that is the way to inspire people to, um, to adopt it. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be like the Pope displaying like uh, an, 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 a very institutional strict way to be good. Um, not to not to criticize the Pope or anyone who might have an ex who might uh, who might applaud that example, but the the in our in our context in Jamaica, which is very church heavy, um, but at the same time still very poor, people try to be good in in all the small ways that they're able to be good, and that involves you know like the way that they bring up their kids and the ways that they try to offer better opportunities for them. So the light to dark but also the dark that is that is in recognition of the light is a lot about me thinking about Kush, Sheldon, his, uh, his influence on me, but also his influence on his son and how that's going to ideally perpetuate a cycle that continues that positive influence on whoever else his son might influence, whoever else I'm, I may speak to about this story who, who I, who I would hope takes the positives out of it and takes the, 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 the good example that he left out of it. And then also to, to be totally honest with you, the painting is also me, it's me working through the stuff that I can't help but work through as an artist, which is which is when I when I learned that he died in such a way, I'm thinking about the rhythm of the beating heart. I'm thinking about what happens when a heart when a heart stops and what happens when that rhythm is interrupted, what happens when it goes from, you know, one, two, three, four, to like becoming more staccato, to becoming quieter, and then kind of not necessarily flatlining, but almost like underwater. There's people, you know, people who have near death experiences say that it almost feels like, like, you know, like everything is muffled or like, it's sh like, you don't feel like you're not alive. You just feel like you're someplace else. And um, so, you that, know. That, David, what about that fifth, that fifth painting, transit, that one? Because there's a transition that's in this one. Yeah, how, how did that, first of all, I wanted to, 
did you put all the uh, surfaces up together? And did you work them all up together or one at a time? But it was first, these four, these four it, were these four that, came first, painted. and then these four came after. So what it about was that, like that one right there. The, it was four and four, and then this one. I mean, I knew this one was going to be yeah. crucial because it is the transition piece, like you mentioned. Um, it's the one that yeah. has to has to carry a lot of this tone through all this weight into here, which you can kind of, which you can still see, but at the same time, it introduces the breaks in the, in the, in the rhythm that, that, that punch in the darkness or the, um, the, uh, a little bit more density of concept, so to speak. And then this piece is, this is one of those things that, uh, again, just worked its way in kind of out the story behind the butterfly here is that, um, I went to the Natural History Museum like a month or a month and a half ago with a friend of mine who is part of my alumni group, Prep for Prep, that I that is also in like my bio. You guys can look at that stuff on your own time. But um, she is a 20 year like volunteer of the Natural History Museum. So we went to go see their new butterfly exhibit in the Gilder Center, which is one of their um, new uh, wings that they opened up. And it's a live butterfly exhibit where they have butterflies from different species all around the world that they ship in the, the pupas and they they uh, incubate them there. And then when they hatch, they put them all in this in this room. It's like a shared environment. Um, but because she's a 20 year volunteer, she was able to ask the people who were working there to show us their the dead bucket that they keep on the side. So there's like a bucket that they hide from all the kids in the corner that um, they have to sweep up all the butterflies that die overnight into this bucket so that they're not just dead butterflies all over the place when people come in the next morning. and so she asked to see it. And I, unfortunately, the, the day that we asked, the bucket was empty. But this little guy was like dead right on the little windowsill next to the bucket. So I, so I kind of just went, I kind of just opened up my little wallet and I told her, hey, slide it in there. And she was like, what are you going to do with it? It's, it's already dead. And I was like, good, that, that, that means that I can use it. So I, I wasn't even halfway done with this first section of this painting when I took that. It wasn't like I took it planning to put it here. I had it in my studio for probably the, the whole month that I was moving from this half of the painting into this half. And this this has everything to do with practicality. This is because I can only have four of these panels on the floor in my studio space at one time. So I had to work in that modular fashion. Um, and and it's obviously within that restriction that I had to you know, figure figure out how to make this thing feel contiguous, feel like one thing. And when I was, while I was working on these these four, this one, as I mentioned, became crucial because it is the transition piece. And that was what helped me decide to put the butterfly in this piece because I felt like if it wasn't any of these, it would have it would have felt not only too late, but it would have introduced something something else that would have that could potentially taint all of what you see before in, in, in the implication of you moving left to right across this thing. But also if you move right to left, it introduces something at a point that's interesting enough that as it transitions this way, and it becomes, right. or it, it and it reintroduces some light. It's still effective to move through to move across it that way because it's not like it's just it, it can it can come off as death in one way or it could come off as life in another way. And the butterfly is obviously this charged trend, uh, symbol of of life and death and metamorphosis and going from one state into another. That for me is could come across very heavy handed, and so I had to interrogate that decision a lot about like you know what positioning to put it in and. And especially what area I was going to lay it in, where it's the tone and the value of its own uh, wings wouldn't strike the surface too hard to distract from the paint itself, which is obviously it's a painting. So it's it's not like it's it's not a it's not a butterfly collage. It's a painting that a butterfly is a part of. Um, uh, yeah. I, I, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful painting. I mean, a beautiful uh, installation there. Yeah, it's it's cool because it's, it also is um directly across from the entrance of the space. So when you step in it, you see it from like the far the far end, but you don't really get a lot of that sumptuous detail until you come in close. Which is, I think, those two um characteristics are necessary for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Do we have enough time? What I love about it is, it, it, what I love about it is when you look at the whole thing. I mean, I don't know if I would ever get to everything that you just said about 
what's happening in there, but you look at the whole thing and you, for me anyway, I see, I don't know exactly what it means yet, but it feels true. The whole thing together is like, oh, there's something here that's very unified. Uh, while that blue in the fourth painting is pretty incredible in claw too. Mm. So, I mean, it's like when I look at some of Francois Dessy's really abstract paintings, I'm like, how did he see that? What is that? And I can't even hardly make out what it is, but I have a sensation that it's true. That's what I feel mm. about that wall there. As you move from the light to dark, it's really beautiful. Yeah, I, I, um, this, this kind of work makes, and this is not to like, just because we're talking about it in this context now, I think of Pissarro when I look at this kind of thing in terms of the handling of the space, in terms of moving Pissarro, Camille, Camille Pissarro. Ah, oui, Pizarro. Pizarro. Yes, yeah, Pizarro. The way that the space is like flattened, but at the same time features depth, right? Like a front, a middle, and a back, and, and even a further yeah. back um that that i have to then i have to flatten it even more because that's the nature of this material style of painting but i still have to punch it with 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 something with i still have to make it feel like there is a layer behind there that you are either being kept from or that you can sit with it long enough and and dissect yeah. and i think that's what speaks to the trueness that you're talking about that that this this is not none of this work is the kind of work that's telling you overtly what it's about and and i think that that's in that truth has that kind of at that kind of aspect as well where it it's it's straightforward but it's not obvious so those four paintings on the left right you had them in your studio and you they were on the you were working them all together all at once yes you put those four together yeah I mean, you can see they're conceived together. I just wondered, you brought them all up together at the same time. Yeah, kind of simultaneously, exactly. Yeah. And then did it, and then once they were dry enough to stand up against the wall, and I, and I could put the next four down. Then I did those four simultaneously as well. With the other four standing up. Yeah. Oh, well, the other four were. I yeah. What with the other four standing up. So I'm. So I have those on the wall as a visual reference. And I'm I'm making it with the with the state of mind that yes this is this is one piece that I'm making so I have to make it agree with itself and there has to be obviously a harmony. It's beautiful those red accents in the fourth painting and sort of in the middle down at the bottom, how far out in front they are of all the other strokes in the whole presentation and how they relate to say the dark stroke over in the second painting from the left. There's a lot of relationship between all of the strokes in the painting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm glad to hear that because it, it lets me know that it, that it, that it, you know, it doesn't feel it's, it's, it's imbalanced, but it, but it doesn't feel disjointed. Not at all. That's what I really like about it. It's not just abstract painting sort of exploding all over the place. There's mm -hmm. a unit. That stroke, that diagonal stroke in the third painting from the right, sort of in the middle of the painting and how it is picked up by the purple horizontal stroke in the fourth painting from the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you move, wow, yeah. Well, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make your head big because I know you'll blush, but you taught me that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but. What about the portrait of your grandmother? Mm -hmm. I, can go, I can take you over to this one. Yeah. That's an, I mean, I looked at that on the, I don't want to hog all the time though, but anyway. <laughs> wow. wow, look at that. So, can you talk about that one in relation to your grandmother? How you? Yeah, sure. Um... My this the, the full title of this piece is Portrait of My Grandma as Nanan as Queen Nanny of the Maroons. And the as Queen uh, as, Nanny of the what? As Queen Nanny of the Maroons. Ah, okay. 
And the Maroons are actually the, so the story of the Maroon people in Jamaica is that the, I believe it was, I think when the, I think the Spanish were there first and then they, they left Jamaica and this is when like the, the uh, United, the like European uh, crown was taking over. One of the last things the Spanish did when they left was they freed all of the slaves that they had in bondage. And those people um, escaped into the deep jungles in Jamaica and met with and formed a society with the last remnants of the, what we call in Jamaica, the Arawaks, the Arawaks, which are the, uh, the native peoples of the Caribbean who were living there already. Their population had been mostly decimated by disease and you know all the other stuff that uh, came along with the colonialism. And so the last little bits of their culture, they taught to the African, um, to the African peoples that were brought across the, across the ocean. And they were basically amalgamated into this culture that was that is now known as the Maroons. They still exist in Jamaica, autonomous from the government, um, and have been for hundreds of years now in their own pockets of society that are deep in these in the most, you know, in the most like lush jungle regions of Jamaica. So Queen Nanny was one of actually their leaders in the uh, in the mid 1700s. Um, and so the painting, this painting is like a uh, what it is, is a foil. It's a comparison. It's uh, it's a um, it's it's almost like me building two statues of the two of them side by side. Um, it's, I'm creating a conversation between my grandma and Queen Nanny as strong figures in their community, strong um, maternal matriarchal uh, women, and and you know uh, emphasis on women because for Queen Nanny to have been a female leader at the time and in the context under which she was leading is hugely significant and. Um, you know, very, and, and, and uh, rare. It's, it's not something you would have found in a lot of places. Like not only are the people enslaved, not only are a lot of other people enslaved, but she was also the leader of the Maroons at a time when they were dealing with a lot of military skirmishes with um, the plantation government um, as it pertained to their autonomy and which lands were theirs and which lands were not theirs. Um, so that's, that's a lot of where some of, the, some, of the, some of the violence in this painting comes in. Is it's, it's remarking on the way in which the beauty of not only Queen Nanny as a figure, but my grandma as a figure arises from a context that is very uh, brutal, right? I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not easy stuff that these people had to deal with, whether it was Queen Nanny in, 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 in a much more um, uh, like lack of value of life sort of historical context, or whether it's my grandma in a, in a quote unquote more modern time, but still a time steeped in poverty uh, my, um, my mom is the oldest of my grandmother and, grand and grandfather's seven kids. And they raised those seven kids along with my grandmother's youngest brother, because he, his mother was unfortunately sick when he, when he was born and not able to raise him. So they raised eight kids, a house full of 10 people. And that the house, the same house that I showed you guys in the pictures before, um, they raised all those people in that house. But at the time it was just one room against the hill. So it was 10 people sleeping in one room with like an, uh, the kitchen on the outside, the bathroom on the outside. That's how my mom and aunts and uncles grew up. And yet, whenever they talk about their upbringing, they always talk about it uh, with, with, with love and, um, and nostalgia. Because even though they didn't have much in terms of material possessions, they always, they most of the time had enough food um, and they had each other. And that was really what my grandma, my granddad, especially both have disseminated to our family in terms of the lessons and the way that they teach us to relate to one another. And so, you know, I think of my grandmother in as somebody in the line of these very influential, strong-willed, loving, um, matriarchal women um, that, that Queen Nanny is in that same line of uh, historically. So, she, you know, they, they even have a, um, a statue built to her in Maroon Town in Jamaica um, in their, in the square of, their historical leaders. So she has a statue and a couple of their other guys have a statue. But again, you know, you, you're not going to find already in history, women leaders are hard to find. And, you know, oftentimes they it's because, you know, it's like like a king dies or something. And so the, the lady becomes like, you know, the dowager empress in China or something like that, or their or their kid is in charge, but they're leading behind the shadows. This is a totally different context from that. This is literally, you know, like, like plantation slavery, like uh, you are like an autonomous people in the in the bush. And, and this is who we go to for, for our leadership is this lady, because 
that is the respect that she command that she commanded and that she still commands in Jamaica. Um, her she she's actually on, I believe it's the five hundred or a thousand dollar bill in Jamaica, Queen Nanny. So, you know that's 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 the way that we revere those figures in Jamaica. You know, up here we're still trying to get Harriet Tubman on a twenty dollar bill, uh, that they told us they were going to do years ago. But in Jamaica, Queen Nanny has been on the money for years, and you know she's a huge part of our cultural identity. And um, so yeah, that's 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 a lot of what's going into this painting is conveying that and thinking about that and then also applying colors that speak to the richness of the landscape within which those people were able to fertilize and grow those the values that now permeate you know not only my family but a lot of a lot of Jamaican culture a lot of those colors are thinking about that the earth tones the reds the greens even the yellows that 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 are that are sometimes scarce but do pop up um and then and then a lot of the a lot of the surface as you can see is scraped away. This painting is on actually copper sheet that's mounted onto wood. I can, uh, I can show you like the side, you can see like how it's mounted right there. Um, this is, you know, really, really like annoying to handle, <laughs> but but really rewarding. Um, what about the lights, David? The, the lights that are around the center, sort of. You mean the physical lights or the lights of the piece? The lights of the piece up at the top. Mm -hmm. You've got the light browner strokes, and then they come by the vertical on the right, and then at the bottom there you have the sort of lighter whiter that goes I mean, around center like this. The, yeah, all of that. All you of that is, top. all of that is the copper. Where those are areas where I scraped away paint and re-exposed right. the copper surface. So all of that that you're seeing there, and that's that's kind of the fun thing about it, right? Is that it creates a um, a little bit of a paradox because it's behind the paint, but it registers almost as foreground because of the value that it presents. Thanks, David. Absolutely. And then, yeah, a lot of this hair is like that same scraped off paint that I like reapplied. Hmm. So it's kind of, it almost feels like it's floating there, but it also introduces shadow and, um, you know, makes the painting a little bit more sculptural. This is, this is a lot of what I was talking about before when I meant that, like, when I said that, like, I couldn't just keep making stuff like this because the room would have felt ridiculous. Uh, this is, this is, this is made more effective because some of the work over there across the wall is really, is, is really thin. So, so when you come to this, there is a contrast that makes it come across, you know, with more intensity. Yeah. But you're seeing literally like, this is the back of some of this, like, like this might've been the skin that I peeled off from right here and then reapplied, but flipped it around. So you're seeing the reverse of that layer of red that you're seeing on the front here. Wow. Or even like areas, areas like here, you're seeing a little bit more of like this, the sort of sandy soil tones that were that would have been underneath here that I scraped and like lifted it up so you could see. There's areas like that where the paint just pulls off and you're seeing some of the green that's in there. So this to me is fun because again, that conversation between what you can and what you can't see, like what is the painting giving to you and what is it taking away where you have to complete it or where you have to let it go because that's also a, an important part of life. And, you know, it's it, 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 a lot of that is in this history as well. Being okay with letting go to find something new, which can sometimes be hard, <laughs> but you know, let's, let's, before we get into the, the, the therapy session there. <laughs> that's beautiful, David. I love how the copper surface comes through. I think you mentioned earlier, you said something about inherent luminosity and it feels like the the copper surface has that feeling to it. It's so luminous because of, you know, the nature of the metal, but it adds such a lightness to the painting that as you described it, it's a little heavier because of the application of the paint. Mm -hmm. But the copper surface coming through provides such a beautiful luminosity to the whole painting. And it's fun too because it's so like lovely. I said it's in it's in the back, but it it really asserts itself to where it you have to come in close and 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 figure it out, and then that opens up so much of what else is going on with the work. 
Absolutely. I'm just so interested in the story, you know, the story that you told about that painting. I'm just so interested in, one, how long did the painting take? And as you were bringing it up, was it the story that was sort of the impetus of how you were doing things as, as much as sort of the, the aesthetic, you know, what the surface is looking like? You know what I mean? I'm just wondering when you decided to place certain strokes in certain places, were you sort of thinking of your grandmother in that moment or were you thinking oh the painting needs red here see what i mean the two different kinds of ways mm -hmm. i think that one the first question that you asked is what opened me up to asking the next the, the, those those more technical questions because and this is the painting where i can admit it very very freely um that a lot of and a lot, it's, it's it's a feature of a lot of abstract work i think in general but I can definitely, because this painting is also a journey of me through this through this material to to to, to make it as compelling as possible visually. Right. It it starts with me, the, the and this is this is like usually how my process goes anyway. The first layers that I that I'm applying are usually very thin, and that, those are the layers where I'm where my mind is much more, um, in a conceptual place, and by that I mean I'm thinking about like my grandma and Jamaica and that's kind of the found that relates to the foundation of color that I'm laying in the first layers that are light that sit on top of one another and start to stack that's what lends itself to like th these conversations that you start to get behind in the in the in the in the back of these paints that I like scraped back up but there is always a time Sometimes it's at the very end, sometimes it's midway through, sometimes it's early, sometimes it's 60%, you know, it's, it's different for each work. There is always a time where that kind of stuff steps into the background. And then the questions and the conversations that I'm having in my mind are totally and 100% about the, the, the characteristics of the painting in front of me. And that's always the point where I know that the work is doing what it needs to do, because now it's 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 able to graduate from being about something that I care about into being something that is visually compelling and that is going to potentially inspire somebody to want to care about those things too. And, and, and at the same time, like I said before, I'm, I'm okay if it doesn't do that because that's not the point. The point is for it to do something at all. Um, and and that's, usually, that's usually the place, again, when I get to that place, when I start to notice things like the way that this like blue is sitting here, and how it likes and how it specked off from like this area but then when i rubbed it this way it probably came over here but then it also connects with this this strip right here and then it answers itself back all the way over here in this in this like piece of texture that is like a, a really a speck of blue paint that just got covered in red if you if you see that there that kind of stuff yeah. those become more overt and those became more overt in this work when i started to apply these kind of thick this these thick layers of paint after letting the, the thin layers dry over the course of probably the first month and a half this painting probably took like four months total three or four months um yeah uh but that's that's kind of probably probably i would say maybe like in the in the beginning of the second month like or or late in the first month and a half was when i started to like apply the thick the thick colors and then play with those and then and then asking and then that was when i was really only really primarily asking questions about what it needed or or listening to it i should say and listening to what it suggested to me it needed to become most effective and then the you could probably tell just if you do like order of operations that 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 the last step was the scraping away of a lot of the paint to re to reveal back the copper and that was just something i started to do kind of instinctively one day um i've done it in other works before but this is this is where it is the most prominent and of course, that has to do with the resonance of the surface itself and its its necessity in fleshing out this visual this visual space. So, as an artist, if I came into the the gallery, David, would you rather would you rather I because I think if I came in and looked at that painting just by itself in the beginning, I wouldn't go directly to that beautiful story about your grandmother and everything that you said, right? Mm -hmm. Would 
rather me come in and sort of uh, read the title first and know that this is a this is a process of you expressing everything that you express before I got into the painting, or would you rather me come in and sort of just look at the painting and experience it, and then you see what I mean? Look mm -hmm. at the title. And go, oh, this is about Dave. You see what I mean? What I'm, and what I've noticed too is that most people that come in don't even think to like all the exhibition materials are out there in like in like little trays for people to take. Most people yeah. they just you know when they like they'll walk they'll be walking in the entrance and they'll probably they might catch the the edge of one of these pieces in here and just come straight in. So I've I've definitely noticed that and um I I think I I build not only the shows these if I'm gonna do if when doing a show at this scale I build it up not only in my mind but in in the space itself curatorially to be able to exist entirely without context right. because that's what because that's what great work is supposed to be able to do right it establishes its own context that's the kind of stuff that we talk about in our shoots like it's yeah. it, it comes from a place that's very personal it starts there that is the that's like the that's like the 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 zero point on the graph but that zero point doesn't just go out from like zero to 100 in one line it goes like it goes backwards and it goes up and down and diagonal and those are all the directions that if it's good enough, people will be people will care to take it in those directions, you know. But if if it's if it's not, then it'll it'll feel it'll feel static, right? It'll feel like people will walk in and do a loop and then leave and maybe not think about it again. And I I know that this is strong enough work that if you walk in and do a loop and leave, um, it's something is going to stay in your mind, you know, even if you didn't read anything. Um, sure. I just I just I actually just had my high school art teacher here on Monday and, and we we sat in here for like three hours talking about this where you know and she's she's the person I always say to her I learned how to um think about art from a from a from a really like serious fine art perspective in college through programs like Marshoots and through my my undergrad at Gettysburg but I learned how to love art through her and when I say love art I mean really like love not just things that people make but the reasons why and how and the processes and the things that that does to people after it's lived for uh, a year or 500 years or a thousand years or 20,000, all of, all of those aspects of it that I fell in love with through her. And it was the exact same conversation that I was having with her that it was almost paradoxical where she would appreciate the stories and at the same time be like, well, you know what, like with, without all of that, like just, let's just talk about the work, you know? And, and, and then like, and still she would, she agreed as well that um, as personal as it is, the work is, is, serious enough at the right scale and also layered enough materially that it is interesting to look at right that it that it that it's stimulating um outside of the jamaican context and that's part of the point of the show is to be specific about that in terms of from my point of view but allow that the, allow that the freedom to be universal it's not like i'm locking it into you have to look at it this way because that's what i was what i thought about when i made it um, this is this just happens to be what I thought about when I made it. And if you care to, you know, look into those things, I'm happy to offer a, a lot of resources pertaining to that stuff, like the documentary that we're working on, like, you know, um, talks like this that people will be able to access and I'm sure people will watch and enjoy. Um, but at the same time, and this is what I love, too. This is this is how I fell in love with Rothko was not not through like the story, but just by walking in and feeling the work and understanding it because I just sat there long enough in front of it. And you know, it's that standard to which I hold myself and to which I aspire to. So that's like, oftentimes, you know, the the the, the biggest challenge in, in any sort of, especially with this kind of work that I care about a lot. Um, but you know, I, I'm I'm like I was alluding to before. I'm okay with letting go. Um, which I know, like I said, is hard. It's not like it's hard for me, but I I can do it. So if I can do it, then I know that I can challenge myself to do it in with better and better and even more personal work. It's so wonderful because yesterday, when I look at the two paintings on the left, yesterday I took my sister down uh, to Marseille and we went into the replica of the cave paintings that they found in Cassis. Mm -hmm. you know, they made this incredible replica. And you get in this little car and you go into the cave and you go through and see these incredible scratchings and all kinds of things in the caves from... 30,000 years ago and you don't really know what they're talking about but there's a there's a sensation that there's a truth there and 
there's a real relationship. And this is very personal and very unique in relation to your story, but it also is very universal at the same time. There's a connection between how these paintings sit and what I saw yesterday, 30,000 years ago. Nice work. Well, thank you. To, to me, that's like the greatest compliment because that's those those are the things that stay with me the most, especially from our shoots, is thinking about the origins of why we take on the divine task of creation. Right. And and they're it's they're lofty, but at the same time, they don't they come from our most human um needs to respond to the world. Right. And I think that's exactly what those things are. I mean, that that to me is my favorite artwork not not outside of what it looks at but because of what it is yeah yeah incredible so thank you for yeah thank you for even suggesting that this stuff could 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 speak in the same tone as that so beautiful david sorry my um video just cut out there for a second so i switched over to my phone i don't know what's up with my computer. But anyway, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. I think I'm going to um, go ahead and wrap up here because we're almost at the hour and a half mark sure. um, and people might have um, other things to get to. But I wanted to say thank you so much for sharing so much of your work and the stories behind it and taking us through the gallery. It's so incredible to see all of it. Um, and I just wish I was in New York so I could come see it in person and see you in person. Um, but let's give him a round of applause, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, and I will end the recording here, but I'll keep the Zoom open in case anyone has questions um, specifically for David that they want to ask right now. Thank hey, you, Rose. David. Yeah. Well, thank you. One more thing. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for PFP, the students that came oh, over here this yes. summer. Were, the prep oh, for man. prep kids were the <laughs> best. Best, best, oh, best kids. That's, they were, glad to hear oh it. my gosh, the it. shining stars of our summer program. <laughs> they, they tend <laughs> Absolutely. to do Absolutely. Oh, they were so great. Thank you for that connection. We're so grateful. And I actually just spoke to um, Mike last week um, 